Okay, hi everyone. Uh, thank you for a nice introduction. Um, today, I want to talk to you what basically was the word of my PhD, but it's continuous. So I didn't change topic with my postdoc, but continue where I, I stopped in the uh, at last December, which is basically the very largely, uh, very fastly growing field of astro seismology of red giant stars. Well, the AGO, I think this is a star you studied uh, most here, and I don't need to tell you that the, star, the sun has uh, a lot of layers, and probably you all have your favorite layers or zones in here. But the problem is we only have one star, and but to study it to understand the full structure and evolution we need a large sample um, where we, and before that, it was not really possible from ground-based observations to start to have as many stars to really con draw a continuous line for, for a given mass uh, through all stages. A very important ingredient is rotation. Rotation changed the cell structure at a certain time step by through centrifugal, centrifugal force. However, it also changes the evolution by through uh, mixing process and elemental transfer. However, rotation was largely studied isolated, and only now with a lot of, uh, with a um, vast data from the Kepler telescope, we can start to study uh, the evolution of rotation and its impact on the structure. How does a seismologist see the star? So the problem is that we would like to see deep into the star, but as you saw before, we are blocked by the outermost layers and we cannot look directly into it. But there's a way out. We can probe the deep interior of, this, of the sun by using oscillations, by right, just applying seismology. And this is how the sun looks in time series photometry and ground-based spectroscopy from time sets partly spanning more than 10 years. And we see this very characteristic bump at 3,000 microhertz of five minutes, which is the power excess. So also keep this, uh, this term in mind because we will come to that when talking about red giants. If we now would zoom in here, um, we would see that this is a very, that this power excess has a very regular structure and you see that there's, yeah, it's like you have a duplet here, you have an isolated peak here, another duplet here, isolated peak here, and this is repeating on a very characteristic scale that we call delta nu or the large frequency separation. What does this mean? Each of those peaks can be associated with a given spherical harmonic. And it depends. On, on the degree of, uh, on the spherical harmonic or, or no radial or non-radial mode, it depends on how the modes penetrate or propagate through the star or how they react to rotation. So it's vital to get a firm identification for each peak. Luckily, red giants have a very, interest, a very nice structure in the power spectrum that we can do that by basically just uh, identifying certain structures in here. When talking about red giant seismology, we also come to the point of, of, um, of the scaling relations. All peaks in this star are pure pressure modes, meaning that they only propagate outside in the envelope. If we now measure the frequency of the power excess, as well as the separation between modes of the same spherical degree, but different real order, we can plug those numbers into scaling relations, which were established over the last two decades, and can derive the radius and the mass. However, this is not God given, but, um, but there are some assumptions behind, and it's a discussion um, on how to calibrate them or how valid they are. But it seems to work very nicely. So. What's the principle behind seismology? Here I show you um, a very nice stellar model from a hometown which is known for good wine. And you all know that if you go uh, to a barrel and you knock on it, you, will, you can hear if the barrel is full, 
half full or empty. And with a bit of practice, you also can listen, or you can hear if it's a metal or wooden barrel, just from the sound the whole um, arrangement gives you when you're inside it. Well, you know, scientists like to play around. And I'll show you some collaborative effort of Marcus Roth and me. Because at the last conference, we went into a wine cellar. And of course, there were a couple of full and empty barrels. And I took out my iPhone, and Marcus was knocking on the, on the barrel. And this is the actual power spectrum of an empty barrel. If we now do it a bit more sophisticated, we see that in, in stars, we have modes that are excited through convection, go deeper or less deep into the, into the star. Each uh, ray trace characterizes one given frequency, one given mode. And you see, some go less deep, some go deeper. And this depends also on, this is depends on the spherical degree. So it's important to understand which mode we observe and how we can identify that. But the problem is, hardly any mode go deep into the star or actually reaches the core. So we were left blind for the deep interior. Let me remind you of where we started about four, year, four or five years ago, 2009. We had, sim we had already identified, or, well, the, the field had already had identified solar-like oscillations in about two dozen red giants, one main sequence stars, which are shown here. But there's a large bias towards main sequence stars because they have higher oscillation <coughs> frequencies, which are easier to be detected from the ground. There are only a few which are close or in the red clump star. What, so, but what we actually knew from them is that they oscillate. And it was hard to get even more than the, the power excess. And if you were lucky, you could get the large separation. But there was not a lot of uh, groundbreaking science to be done with those information, except showing that they are. Then, but on the other hand, theory predicted a couple of nice treats, which we could find in case the data would be good enough. Like modes that actually could reach the core and would uh, uh, open us the deep interior for seismic analysis, as well just from basic physics, actually, a faster rotating core. But um, then with models, people tried to predict how much faster the core would be spinning. And it was completely open because there was no, um, no observation for those, ta for, for those stars. Now let me show you how in 2011 the field was looking like. This is, again, a hatchback Russell diagram with the temperature and, uh, and here the luminosity. In this case, it's numax, the frequency of power. And you see in this diagram 1,500 stars. This is from the early part of the Kepler mission. In the meantime, we, we have increased the number of stars by another magnitude. Now we're talking about 16,000 red giants. And you see, oh, main sequence stars, sub-giants, and red giants. You see, we find that basically every star is oscillating, which is very good. So we have a lot of work to do for the next couple of generations. How does it look like? If we take a close look, into, zoom into the light curve, and here I take this very intuitive unit of megaseconds, which is a million seconds, in other words, about 12 days, uh, for, uh, 11 point some days. And you see that uh, the stars, you have here a, very, a relatively flat light curve with a f couple of wiggles. And the more you go down, the longer the time scales of the variation is, it's, and also the amplitude curves. If you now translate this into uh, through Fourier into a power in, in power density spectrum, as it's shown here with the same color coding, you see that the power excess again for our giants is moving towards the right, up to the yellow, and also the amplitudes are growing. Now, why are the two below here? In the giants, we have two flavors. We have um, those which are hydrogen shell burning and those which are helium core burning. From the outside, they are not distinguishable. You cannot see from the outside which is which. And you only can estimate from uh, pro uh, possibilities on, from 
sophisticated like um, isotones, but it was never really satisfying. With seismology, we now can distingu distinguish between the two. The key to that was the detection of the so-called mixed modes. It was about a year into the Kepler mission when we suddenly realized that power spectra look messy. Well, we already realized that. Here you see again this small duplet I've shown you before, which is originating from two pure pressure modes. But before, I was pointing out an isolated peak here. Do you see it here? No. You see five modes, which are all independent, all are stable. They cannot be explained by systematics and instrumental effects. So what we then did was by comparing with models, what we then did was to show by comparison with models that this is actually the signature of a standing wave between the pressure mode in the envelope outside and the gravity modes in the core inside. They form a standing wave, and so uh, they can bridge a little zone, the, the evanescent zone, which is separating the two cavities. And so we can get information from inside the star. And what's important for the remaining talk is that you take a, the takeaway message of this slide is that these peaks here are dominated by the outer part of the envelope, while the peaks in what we call the dipole forest, because those are all dipole modes, are dominated from the very center of the, of the core, of the star. Here is the, the proof of how we did it. This is the power spectrum. We were just looking into this range. Here you see the full power spectrum with, again, the repeating part where you have the the doublet, which is the radial and the quadrupole mode here, again here. And we measured the separation between consecutive dipole modes and compared it to a model. And you see that really what we observe here is also shown in the observation, in, in the model. And this is the signature of the coupling with the core. I will, yeah, just to, just to mention, uh, what we actually observe are mixed modes. But we would like to know what the true period spacing is, which is also equidistant in, in period space. And now there are techniques by what we observe uh, from to um, restore the, the true value of the period spacing from the observed value, but which will not be part of my talk. But it's important to mention that this is the period spacing of G modes. How do we investigate? How do we investigate rotation? The big difference between, between radial and non-radial modes is that non-radial modes are actually sensitive to rotation through the effect of rotational splitting. Um, the radial mode would be would oscillate in uh, a full would be in full symmetry. For, for non-radial modes, as we show it here, we have, according to the degree, a given number of lines. Here, I show you. A dipole mode with one nodal line, which you can see as the white. Ah, okay, whatever well, you see it, with the, as a white line here. Now, in case of no rotation, they all have the same frequency. But now, as rotation sets in, you have a geometrical, uh, you have a coordinate transformation, and you also have the Coriolis force, which force the frequency, which is normally you have three peaks at one point be split into individual components. And in this case, we have three components, so we can get three different peaks if you look at the right, uh, right curve. However, there's another information to be drawn from this, because it depends on how you look at those spheres. And so we can get information about the, in uh, rota the inclination of the rotation axis. And depending on your spherical degree and the uh, and, uh, surface uh, appearance, you get different patterns for different modes. So here, for example, you have a L equal 2, and you see for the same inclinations, you get a different pattern, which is very handy because this is actually a mode identification. Okay. What, what we, no, no, what we, do, what we get from the star is integrated light. 
So what we do is, or what Kepler does, it is it observe it observes the star for about five year, four years, and we get a light curve a measurement of the luminosity every half an hour in that case. This yeah. So actually, Kepler was looking at the same star uh, at the same hundred hundred fifty thousand stars for four years, uh, up to two hundred thousand stars. So we have a lot of data, and we take this light curve as i shown before, and we compute the power spectrum. Kepler was looking at, a f uh, at basically a huge map uh, space in, in the sky, which we know as the uh, uh, summer triangulum between Swan, Lyra, and, and Eagle. It's, uh, and so it's huge. It's about that size. If you would put your arm, if you would spread your hand out, no, it was it was it was fixed. It was fixed. It was fixed on the sky, um, and really was always observing the same stars. So it was, Kepler was designed to to search for for planets, and there you want to observe a transit every year or every whatever period. And so it was important to to keep observing the same targets. And so basically, um, ex uh, exoplanet people were looking for. Uh, this little transit, and we are looking in between what they are not interested in. So you see sometimes what is the noise for, for others is our, is our treasure. Um, so we, we were benefiting from that. They needed long light curves, which also is important for us, but we, the longer light curve is, the finer the resolution is, and the better we can resolve those peaks. On the chip, the star is distributed in a few pixels, but this is all integrated light, so we have no spatial information about the surface of the star. Yet, way too far away for that. Okay, so uh, to come back, yeah, and uh, the and the other thing is that we have to distinguish between if we observe rotational splitting of a G mode, or of, a, of a gravity mode, or of a pressure mode, because there are some differences in propagation deep inside the star, which are described with the Ledoux constant C, which will vary the size of the measured splitting, although we have the same rotational um, rotation rate. But I will come to that in, in a minute. So we have coffee here, just to show you the power. Yep. Give me a few slides, please. We will come there. Uh, but you, OK, in this case, I wrote it as rigid, but it, this will get non-rigid, this term up here. So, just to show you the power of rotation inside a star. This is a slide I use in my public talks where I compare how you can steer, uh, how you can um, diffuse milk in coffee, either by putting, in, uh, by putting it in and wait until it's completely uh, diffused and um, equally distributed. But then you have to wait a couple of months and I do not want to drink that coffee. It's not warm, and this is probably the least problem of it. The other thing is, you can introduce turbulence, turbulence by doing rotation. Like also normal people outside the academia might call the steering. And then it will be immediately um, well distributed, and you can drink it in seconds. So the, whole, the same thing happens in deep inside a star, where rotation introduces mixing processes that change chemical species and also kind of refuel the core. So you get significant, significant differences on the evolutionary tracks by including or excluding rotation. How does it look like if we look at this effect of rotation splitting in, in a star? Here again, I present to you the power spectrum of a star where no rotation is found, and we saw that before. If we now go to a, a star where we see rotation, and how do we see it? We find those small duplets. You remember what I was talking before about the splitting of frequencies? It's exactly the same thing. Here you have all frequencies at one spot. But then, as rotation kicks in, this spot, and depending on the rotation rate and the inclination, will be split into several peaks. And here in this case, we have three uh, duplets. And what you see is if you measure the frequency of, the, of each peak, and which is indicated here, you will see that this peak is larger split 
than this peak. And, now, uh, and this is where we have the first indication that the deep interior, and remember, those two peaks are more dominated by the deep interior than the central peak. This is the, ca the first case where we have evidence of a fast rotating interior. Uh, the, if we do the whole thing for the full power spectrum again, you will always find the smallest rotation splitting in the center of the dipole forest. So you see it here, here, and here. While the radial mode is rotationally unsplit, as we hoped it to be, or if it would be rotation split, we would have other things to explain. Because then, yeah. So you see that always the G-dominated or the core-dominated modes have a larger splitting, which is, on the average, 1.5 times larger than the one from the envelope. And we put the whole thing, we, then we, again, compared with the model, and uh, found that the best model, where we assume the rigid rotating core and the rigid, and the rigid rotating envelope, that the, the same core, that the best model is found when the core is rotating 10 times faster than the surface. And if we now would assume rigid rotation, we would get the complete opposite. So we can exclude um, non, we can exclude rigid rotation inside stars. So we we don't assume a gradient. We assume a step function. We um, so there's a number of other things. Yeah. So basically, what we do is we say the envelope is rotating rigidly, the core is rotating rigidly, and then we just calculate based on on that uh, on how the contribution is made to the to the modes. It's an average. It's yeah, yeah. the simplest you can do, but at least we have some indications. So then, yeah, this is just a, a little diagram we did for, for visualizing the, the result, where you find a fast rotating star inside, a uh, fast rotating core inside the slowly rotating envelope. And the envelope would rotate about uh, 200 days or 300 days, which is a year, while the core would be rotating um, on the order of a month. So now we can start thinking of what, what does this do to the internal physics? What are the turbulences? What are the flows? It's far from simple and far from understood. Yep. No. We haven't seen anything close to that. It's, we haven't seen anything of that yet. So, let me... The next slide is not what I wanted to show. So now let's go to larger samples. This is a study I did for, uh, for my PhD, but there are also other, stu other samples studied and published by Mosser. And we basically agree. What we see is, what you see up here in the diagram is uh, the frequency of power excess and the largest rotation splitting measured inside a star. Down here you have the large separation, but don't get, don't get too confused by the different uh, labeling. How you have to read it is that you start with small stars here and you get to big stars here. And the star would evolve from here to here where it would ignite helium somewhere over there and then come back and burn um, quietly the helium in the core in the red, which forms the red clump. And this is why you have this high peak in the distribution. So what you see here is that on the RGB, where you have stars that are burning um, hydrogen in a shell around the core, you have very fast rotation. But when you get to the red clump stars, it seems that they are rotating slower, which is interpreted as a slowdown of the core. Now, what is also very interesting is, and which, which can put constraints on the angular momentum transfer in stars. What is now also very interesting are the white spots in this diagram. So for example, why don't we see any stars here which have a slow rotation? Because we either see fast core rotation or we see nothing, which cannot be explained 
by the split, by the inclination. We don't know what is going on. Then we also don't see anything here, and it looks like a smooth transition. This is one of those nasty coincidences in astronomy that something just looks like um, it would be a transition, but it's not. Because here we have a confusion limit where the rotation splitting gets on the order of the spacing of G, of G modes, and so it becomes a completely mess. It's, I can show you, this is a nice diagram where you see, again, rotation splitting as a triplet here. And if you go higher up on the RGB, it looks like this. But actually, the rotation splitting is not this, but this. So it becomes very difficult to interpret and probably needs automatization. When we, so this is basically um, where we, the first results from Kepler. In the meantime, the field has evolved um, very, very quickly. And I have uh, focused myself on binary stars with an oscillating red giant component. And, especially, and actually, I have focused on a very sp uh, specific type of, of binaries, which are the, the so-called heartbeat stars. People don't like this uh, term so much, so let's call it ellipsoidal uh, variables. But what happens is that those are stars in very eccentric orbits. And when they get, um, most of the time, the two stars don't feel each other, except on the orbit. And when they get close in the periostrum, they start to deform each other according um, to tides. And this is when what you see as a increase or decrease in luminosity at periastra. So this is a regular peak you find every, um, in some cases, every 90 days. And this is then the orbital period of the system. So all here, you don't, you don't see any transit. The only eclipsing binary shown here is this. This is an eclipse. Everything else just depends on, on, the, on the modulation. How does it work? Those Tides can be approximated by the, the tidal effect can be approximated by two L equal two modes. So those modes have two node lines and a special configuration, and therefore it depends again on how we look at them and how they turn away on the orbit. And according to that, we get a very particular, a very characteristic shape, and here I show a few um, textbook-like diagrams on what shapes we, we can um, expect. And then depending on the amplitude, on the, on the width of the event, we can find a lot of information like inclination of the orbital plane, eccentricity, and the mass ratio. So great. We are basically not, in principle, not um, biased anymore to the narrow edge of eclipsing binaries, because those stars can be seen from many different angles. This is where we started from. It's not as beautiful as you always want to have it, but we are getting there. And I think that seismology is doing a great deal in helping on understanding those systems. I show you my, my poster boy um, called Kick5006817, but uh, it's a telephone number, and therefore I called this guy Panoramics, which is an asterisk cartoon. So what you see here is, in black, you see each black dot is a photo photometric measurement from Kepler. Down here, you see the orbital period and the whole light curve. 17 quarters have been, have been folded on the orbital period of 94.82 days. Then I rebind re the whole thing into, into half an hour bins. And this is shown as the red light curve here. And so the effect of, of oscillations, basically, are the difference. So oscillation gives you this white bin, this white width, the whole thing. So you see how, how large, actually, oscillations are. Since we assumed uh, we have about 20, we have 20, 20 orbits. And the next thing is, so in a bin, this was the first star. And when we found it, none of this non red giant in such a system was known. So the next step is to go to your telescope, to your favorite telescope, which in this case was uh, the Mercator telescope on La Palma here, which basically belongs to Theo Leuven, my 
uh, former uh, university, and we took measurements. And we followed this star up, uh, we followed on this star for two years with about 50 measurements or 60 measurements. And what you see is each dot is a measurement. And the error bars of the radial velocity, which we derive from the spectra, are shown. They're just smaller than the dot. So we get down to about 10 meters per second. And the blue line is the orbital model that we fit to the, to the, to the radial velocities. And you see it very nicely coincides that at the periaston, you have also, you have both. You have the largest difference in radial velocity and the, peri and the ellipsoidal modulation. We split this project into, into three sub-projects, which are now combined in a paper. So we did a seismic analysis, we did a light curve modeling, and also we did, to some extent, a binary evolution study. Because the system is very, very small, in, it's very close at periastron. From seismology, we know that the star has roughly six solar radii. But the periastron, the two stars are getting closer than five solar radii. So the red giant doesn't need to get much larger to actually start to have the companion dive through the outer envelope, and which could lead to a um, common envelope phase, which eventually could lead, will lead to the destruction of the system just by ejection of the envelope. And we think that those systems can be progenitors of SDB stars slowly um, um, subdwarf, subdwarf B stars as all catalytic variables. So that's an idea we were following. The seismic part, which was very interesting, because we ha uh, was very interesting because we had a very rich power spectrum. This star had the richest power spectrum of all 18 stars that we have reported in this paper, all with solar oscillating components. <clears throat> and why is a rich power spectrum important? Because each mode is like a probe to go through the, through the interior. And each mode probes slightly different, different range, so we can, the more modes we have, the better we can con um, constrain the interior of the star. On top of that, we also had a very interesting rotation splitting pattern, which is very complicated, but we could break it, which allows us to constrain the core to surface rotation inside the star. And when we start, of course, you always have some expectation of what you will find. And we, I was thinking of, well, we have a red giant in a very eccentric um, system with a, a fluffy envelope. I was expecting that the envelope would be rotating much faster than, a, uh, than in other stars. However, we did the straightforward testing of the rotation splittings, meaning that the measured ones, which are shown in, uh, as blue dots here, were compared with synthetic rotation splittings. And we get a very good agreement, which indicates a quarter surface rotation of 13 times, one three of the quarter surface, which is basically not different to what, we, what I just showed you, because this star is slightly higher up, so we expect a faster rotating core. So it's not different. On top of it, uh, we try to include what could be L equal to rotation splittings? Because they would be, out, they would probe basically the envelope and not the core. But you see, also they basically agree. What does it uh, tell us about the system? We can get the surface rotation, which is about 165 days, and we can compare it to the orbital period, which is 95 days. And we can exclude pseudo-synchronous rotation, which is important because it's, this gives us some idea about the, the time scales. It's 1.7 was not expected. Furthermore, and also this value um, is in agreement with the Vs and I from the spectroscopy. So if you correct for inclination, which we know from the, from the shape of the, of the splittings, we get we get uh, to roughly the same value. Another thing is that we can get the inclination, which is uh, from the inclination, which is 77 degrees, with probably a slightly overestimated error bar, and can, can compare it to the inclination of the orbital plane from fitting the light curve. 
you see there is some there's a disagreement on the level of two sigma. Question is, how reliable is that result? Because we could not uh, investigate an effect which, from theory, should be there. When the star is coming towards you and going away, it's not only the line shift, lines that shift, but also you get a Doppler beaming, which increases or decreases slightly the flux, which of course would have an increase on the light curve, uh, a change on the light curve. We didn't find it. What we do is, the, uh, what what we do is we blame the, we blame Kepler for it because this period is very close to the order of um, the length of a quarter of the data unit. The length data comes down from a satellite, and probably if you if you search for a tiny effect which is on the order of the data length, you probably miss it. We spent significant effort to to find it. But we, we didn't find it, so we have no ideas on how to investigate it. But from theory, it should be there, and it is seen in other stars. And red giants should be very well suited to show it um, because of the spectral energy distribution. Now, enough of diagrams. Let me show you another cartoon. This is, this is um, how the system actually looks like. You see here the red giant, and here you see the companion that uh, we could determine from combining seismology and light curve fitting and spectral disentangling to a uh, um, main sequent uh, red dwarf with 0.3 solar masses. So um, you see such a combination of techniques has a great potential of understanding the full system and giving, giving you information about, star, about companions that you don't see. Now, leaving the single case study, um, I'm going to the catalog part of the paper, where we, uh, where we describe 18 of such systems that we found. And here I show you again a hatchmont russell diagram with temperature and luminosity. And each dot is a system that we found. And the radius uh, and the mass, which is color-coded, was derived from seismology. And the dot shows you the orbital period of the, um, of the system. In gray shade, you see the distribution of the Kepler red giants. And this spot, for your reference, is the, is the red clump of all red giants, where they burn uh, hydrogen, uh, helium in the, in the core. The interesting thing is, the sample does not really stick out of all Kepler data. We have between 0.9 and 2 solar masses. And the orbits are, well, relatively long compared with what we see in Kepler, but this is a selection effect. The interesting thing is that all stars appear to be hydrogen shell burning stars. So they are relatively young. And we again come to the point that we think that those stars actually destroy themselves, the system dest destroy themselves when they're larger because they will go undergo a common envelope phase. What we did then was we monitored all of those systems intensively with the Hermes spectrograph. And um, so we can constrain also the, the eccentricity of the systems, which is shown in the lower panel where you have the orbital eccentricity as well as the orbital period. And it could be that could be some even evolution. We, we don't know yet. Very interestingly, we find a clump around an eccentricity of 0.7. And the red giant I was talking about before, panoramics is in here. Uh, par parallel to our work, some other stars have been found. Similar stars have been found in the large Magellanic cloud. And those systems are shown as squares in both diagrams. And you see they also even nicely line up this kind of, of evolution. Above you see the orbital period versus the stellar radius from seismology. And it could be that this is actually also another line, which is, comes from selection effects. But you see that we don't find systems which, are which have shorter periods uh, under this line, which again could be an indication that those systems destroy each other. Yeah, what else? 
so there was, yeah, there was the this was the discussion of the of the heartbeat sample. Finally, not everyone has to do Kepler photometry. There are also other tools to study solar oscillations. If you remember, uh, in the in, in introduction, I showed you a diagram of photometry and of space photometry of the sun and ground-based spectroscopy. The same thing we can do with solar oscillations in other stars. We just need the machines to be efficient enough and stable enough to find meter per second uh, variations of line profiles in, fa in relatively faint stars or bright stars. So as a kind of backup for my, for my, for my PhD, because it was defined before Kepler was actually launched, and things can go on up into orbit, we selected, we, we also set up a multi-site campaign on two bright red giants, um, which we selected on several effects, uh, parameters like visibility and position, brightness. We also wanted to study rotation and also what were other constraints we found on the, on, from the literature. And we came up with two red giants. One was, was Gamma Pisci, um, yeah, a relative, not, not that well-known uh, star. And the other one, and this is why it's below added values, is Theta 1 Tau. It is a red giant in the Hyades, and it's a red giant in the binary. So we, can, we have a lot of parameters well constrained just by the membership in the binaries and also information from uh, the binarity. The campaign utilized five, mainly five different telescopes, the um, OHP in, in France, then the Mercator telescope again on La Palma, and also the Euler telescope in Chile. On top of that, Okayama was um, one of the main contributors to the data. And we also obtained interferometry with the VLT on Gamma Pisci because Theta 1 Tau was already reported in the literature. So here you see uh, the truth of ground-based data. You see time series, the top one shows 110 days, the bottom one shows 190 days, and each color, uh, and please check the, um, the, the dimension of the, of the y-axis, this is meter per second. This needs either in cell calibration or, cal or um, simultaneous thorium argon calibration, and each color is a different telescope. Now, it's a nightmare to calibrate that and standardize that. But what you see is that all uh, four follow a long periodic variation, which we interpret as the surface rotation of a star. It's less clear, and forget about this, it was instrumental effects. Um, it was less clear for Theta 1 Tau, but we found 160 days for Theta 1 Tau. And in the literature, the, um, there are studies of the emission of uh, calcium H and K for this star, which report a value of the rotation rate which is very close to ours. So we are confident that those variations, which are intrinsically in all independent data sets, um, that those are actually surface rotation effects. When we now go into and calculate the Fourier, uh, the power density diagram, we don't see a lot of for gamma PSC, although we have clear indication of the oscillations, which are just located at basically half of the daily alias. <laughs> so we things things um, are bad, and it's difficult to calibrate them. For theta one tau, it's we find a clear oscillation bump, but for both we could derive um, a large separation. By knowing what of here, by knowing that we have to look in this range, and we confronted that with um, our analysis of of interferometry, which is quite good, and we thought, oh, this might be a mismatch, but now um, we were pointed, and uh, it was pointed out to us that actually uh, those values, which um, were reported in literature, could be overestimated, which. Um, which would put this value just towards our result, which is a stable seismic result. So concluding on that, we are 
in agreement with interferometry and found uh, two the power sets, uh, found seismic parameters for uh, two bright stars, which are now can be investigated with other techniques because they are so bright. So the outlook: Why I'm in America? Why I'm here? Because I'm collaborating with those guys here. We work on surface rotation, also um, activity and magnetic fields. Um, another reason was I was um, combining this stay here with a Mesa boot camp in uh, with a Mesa Evolutionary Code boot camp in Colorado uh, in in California, and we hope that all will feedback on our understanding from solar light dynamics. Well, we have a long way until we understand it, and that's why um, I'm also working on other case studies, like picking out interesting cases for my sample and new targets which we identified. In this case, we have um, we have a radial velocity, uh, we have a binary with an eclipse, which is actually a triple system, which will be very interesting to analyze, and and huge potential comes from um, from double line spectroscopic binaries, where we get information on um, um, on both components from spectroscopy, and if we are lucky, if we find them, even from seismology. Good, yeah. So this was uh, just to conclude. Yes, we can reach the core, and yes, it's rotating faster than the surface. We also saw that the rotational gradient is in binaries, or at least those we've, we have investigated, it's not different to single field stars. And those results open many more questions that they answered, like what is the detailed internal rotational profile? Then what is the evolution of angular momentum transport? And how do the uh, turbulences and flows influence the evolution? And you can add your favorite item down here and uh, all those are pieces which will hopefully help us to understand the puzzle of rotation in stars in many different uh, evolutionary stages. And I thank you for your attention, and I'm happy for discussion. couple of magnitudes larger. Okay. That's, we were actually shocked by the slow rotating core okay. because there were p the paper I pointed yeah. out was uh, if we could answer that it would be it would be great but it was actually so the paper so the, the paper uh, someone pointed out the paper by Ed Berger was talking about the core rotation a factor thousand of the surface. So I think that the core is not spinning up that much as we expected. Um, yeah, this is... Yeah, okay, thank you. It's a 10,000 in the, in the center. Yeah, it's, it's tiny, yeah. I'm not aware of that.
and the question is, does the, yeah, does the core know what the surf, uh, about the magnetic activity of the surface and vice versa? So it's, they are so detached that basically they're two different regimes. Except Tatamon Tau, everything is below two solar masses. Tatamon Tau is the most massive one with around 2.7 to 3 solar masses. That is the most massive one. Yeah. But it's uh, also, if you look at the histogram of, of Kepler, you, ba this is ba you have the median at 1.3 and basically everything else between 0.3. 7, 8, and 2. So it's basically the majority is, this is the, the, uh, the common sample. Which one? Is, a, is another one now. I just. I just had the feeling that you know when the stars are really getting slow, are uh, in some way oscillation compressed? I was. Uh, it's a very good question. Yeah. You somehow might expect that, and I did some testing on that, and I couldn't find anything. Okay. So it looks like that the scatter from the dark point is kind of much yeah, uh, Honestly, here for example, I wouldn't say so. Yeah, no, I wouldn't say so. Just why? Of the of the red giant. Okay. So because I didn't see any um, sp twos in there, uh, double line spectroscopic binaries, uh, it's the brighter um, the brighter component, which is probably the red giant, because otherwise we would see both components in the power spectrum. So all what I show here is um, basically the radial velocity from the from the main from the primary component. The other one would be um, larger according to the mass ratio, independent of V and I. So this is a very convenient thing uh, to show. Yeah. 